Hello, everybody, and uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Beyond the Horizon. I'm Glenn Lytle, and we are here today to talk about how data centers and wireless service providers are growing the community. Uh, we've got a great uh, group of panelists here for a roundtable discussion on uh, sharing some perspective, again, on, on data centers and WISPs growing the community, but also uh, the impact that, that we're seeing in terms of broadband capabilities, access to data centers, uh, et cetera, from a rural perspective, from a metro perspective, uh, and, and, and what the future holds in that regard. So a uh, quick housekeeping item. We've got uh, a pretty action-packed uh, agenda here, so we will try to leave some time at the end for some questions. If you've got some questions along the way, feel free to put them in uh, in the chat box. There should be a question field. We will do our best to get through as many of those as we can. If we don't, we'll certainly circle back and, uh, and try to get some attention to those after the fact. Uh, so again, my, my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. We've got um, some expertise from a data center perspective as well as a wireless uh, service provider. I'll start with uh, Dave Brown. He's the CEO and board member of Southeast Broadband, Southeast Ohio Broadband Cooperative. Uh, he's got expertise in cybersecurity as well as fixed wireless. So uh, Dave, welcome to the call. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the invitation and glad to be here. Uh, talking about a topic that is obviously near and dear to my heart. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, next, we have Nancy T. Meyer. She's the account director at Cologix, also executive board member for uh, Ohio IX. Nancy, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, Cologix, if you're not familiar, uh, we have data centers. We have about 37 data centers in 11 different markets today. Um, expanding to a 12th and uh, have three here in Columbus about to build a fourth. Great. Glad to have you, Nancy. Thank you for that. And then last but not least, uh, we've got John McKenna, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at Expedient. John, welcome. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, yeah, so I'm responsible for our partner and channel alliances program here at Expedient. And uh, Expedient, uh, we actually started out as a network company 20 some years ago. And then got uh, migrated to the data center business with with retail colo and then started doing cloud a while back and uh you know really what we're seeing growth in is our, our cloud business seeing a lot of companies migrate to the cloud and then attach co-location with it uh, so that's kind of our sweet spot and really where we're growing right now is uh, seeing all of the cloud providers that businesses are working with uh, we've actually built out a multi-cloud solution which uh, uh, has been just a, a big advantage for our partners and our clients just helping them manage everything that's out there so yeah this is an area i'm very passionate about i, I started out in telecom uh, with the CLEC business that uh, nancy and i used to work together and uh, back in the day uh, yep. and then uh, owned my own business doing cloud consulting for about eight years been in the uh, cloud space for 12 and a lot of experience with fiber you know working with economic development with municipalities at the state level but also public safety education and you know this stuff is so important uh, to what we do statewide and I think you see the communities that have it and those that don't, and there's big differences. So excited to be part of this conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Glad to have you. And, and again, thanks for joining us, uh, Dave, John, and Nancy. So, so we'll jump right in. You know, it's, it's funny, you, you, you know, I think in, in, in John, you were mentioning the, the, the back in the day reference. Um, you know, I think pre-pandemic, pre right, you think of, of BCDR, you think of business continuity and disaster recovery, and, and, and I think, you know, John, you had mentioned it in a prior discussion um, where, you know, it was, it was kind of pitching, well, what happens if there's a pandemic? What are you going to do? What's your business continuity plan? And I think, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, um, you know, over the course of the last year and a half, everybody was forced to deploy a business continuity strategy. Uh, and so for the most part, that meant working from home, um, you know, and so how do you, how do you keep the continuity going with your business? And so again, that being the work from home um, strategy, you know, the, the question is how much has that made people think about the overall network design in terms of hosting, in terms of application models, um, you know, and, and do we feel like, that network design really becomes a permanent way of doing business. I mean, how much does that landscape change, you know, relative to what we're all forced to do? So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pitch it to, to John first, 
you know, what are your thoughts on, on that really becoming a permanent way to, to do business today? Yeah, I think it's definitely become a permanent business uh, or permanent way of doing business. And, and each business and each even role within an organization may vary slightly. But, you know, I, I think I mentioned when we talked before, you know, there were, you know, IT departments that we couldn't talk to for a week or two because they were just trying to figure out their VPN <laughs> solutions of shifting everything from all the data coming in to, you know, or being there to, to everybody being distributed and trying to get in. But we're, we're seeing it in all kinds of nuanced ways. I mean, you know, desktop is a service and VDI is, is, is big. We're seeing companies that couldn't get into their data centers. Uh, and so that's something that, you know, co-location provides us some uh, ways to mitigate your risk by having somebody else responsible for operating that. There's just layers. And I think just what we're seeing now is that continued push to businesses recognizing what is it that I do that I have to do? And what is it that I could do to push to others so that if something like this or otherwise happens that I'm in a, a better uh, position to, to handle it than maybe I was the first time around? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Nancy, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I know a lot of customers in the beginning, you know, we have one of the nice things is we are space and connectivity is huge for us. So for example, in Columbus, we have over 50 carriers that our customers can connect to. And a lot of our customers have their core network there. So in the beginning, we saw a lot of people that obviously were trying to boost all of that network capability so that they could reach everyone. Um, but in talking to them now, they have learned a lot of things. One, they were forced to do things that they've been talking about for years. So they had to put them into play very quickly. Um, you know, the cloud, as John has said, has become prior to you know, the pandemic, I had a lot of companies talking about wanting to go to the cloud and doing those kind of things. And since then, that's changed to what more of a hybrid cloud and where are we going to participate? And luckily, we have those on ramps for them as well. So in talking with the customers, they're now looking to say, this works great. You know, everybody was waiting for all these terrible things to happen. And what they realized is productivity was there. And, you know, they were able to get the bandwidth and they were able to do what they want. So now a lot of companies, you know, I have several that have given up, at least for the IT department, have given up their um, office space and are work from home or doing a hybrid. So definitely see this continuing into the future. Yeah, absolutely. So, so kind of pivoting, you know, maybe Dave into more your arena. So, so seeing that from the data center perspective, what impacts, um, does that really have on on broadband capabilities you know i mean i think you've got some experience down in southeast ohio relative to the rural nature there so you know talk to us a little bit about how how the how that has really impacted broadband capabilities and the importance of broadband we're actually working on this from the complete opposite end of the spectrum and, and that's the last mile how people can get connectivity because as we went through the pandemic and people were sent to work from home and kids were sent home to, to do homeschooling or do online schooling, things moved more and more into those data centers. And it just proved the need that we have for that last mile to get people connected so they can access more and more of these services as they come online. And it has made a huge difference in people's lives to be able to get that kind of access. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, you know, talk a little bit more about that, that access, Dave. I know, you know, in a prior conversation, you were sharing, um, you know, th that you had recently made a move back to the region, right? So you were down in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, I, I think you mentioned, and um, <clears throat> lots of connectivity, you know, where you had currently lived, had, had great broadband capabilities, and moved back to the region. Marietta, I believe, I believe is where you, uh, you moved to, and then... And then boom, now all of a sudden, you know, broadband plays a major part in, in accessibility from the home. Um, you know, so talk a little bit about, you know, maybe how, the, how you looked at that a little bit differently. And, and again, someone that sits in the seat that you sit, but also, you know, how does that change the dynamic of, of how people look at where they live today? You know, so as they're evaluating um, you know, what are some of the important thing, things that people are, are looking at? Is it, you know, you know, broadband capabilities now become a part of, of, of criteria, buying criteria from a living space? But then secondarily, um, well, hey, if, if I'm working remotely, why can't I work from, you know, Miami instead of uh, Columbus? 
So maybe talk a little bit, Dave, about how, you know, how that impacted you and, and, uh, and how we see it impacting the, the communities around us. Yeah. And, and I'm originally from the area. Uh, I spent a few years in North Carolina. And when we moved back, never occurred to me when we bought a house less than six miles out of Marietta proper to ask the question, can we get high-speed internet? Can we get broadband access in this house? Uh, it was just an assume that it wasn't a question you'd even ask in a, in a city like Raleigh and probably not a question that's asked very often in big cities, even in Ohio. So to find out that it wasn't available and, to, you know, start talking with some of my, my neighbors and, and friends in the area, it really is having an impact on everything from people being able to work from home to economic development to the value of people's homes, because it is now a question. You know, we had a neighbor not far away who shortly after the pandemic was told they had to work from home. They had no internet access. They had to sell their house and move to an area where they could get access so that they could keep their jobs. You know, we've got a builder who is putting up a new community in the area, and he's already had two different uh, buyers who have said, we'd love to have a house there. You know, one was coming from Texas, one was coming from Colorado, but they're remote workers and they have to have broadband access. So people want to, you know, with the pandemic and everything that's happened, they want a little more space. They, they like the rural environment. It's a slower pace. It's, you know, but we've got to get the broadband access out there so that they can work and they can connect and they can be a part of the community. There are a lot of services that are dependent on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and Glenn, that gets into the economic development aspect and commercial uses. You know, if you, it reminded me when Dave talked about just being five miles outside, you know, the city of New Albany is only seven miles from the 270 Outer Belt here in central Ohio. And, you know, Jennifer Chrysler and the city of New Albany and the New Albany company are, you know, economic development animals. But when they started recruiting, you know, big companies to come out there and locate, what they found was either that the broadband that they needed wasn't available or it was so expensive because there weren't enough providers to fuel competition. So, you know, they took the initiative of building fiber and now look what that's done for our region. I mean, not just the Facebook and the Amazon and, and everybody that's out there, uh, but, you know, that's also helped Dublin and Hilliard and Grove City and these other cities that or these other municipalities that have benefited. But, you know, it, it isn't always that thing of where you recognize this in advance, but the cost of doing business when it's not there is so much higher. And I think, you know, I, I work with a lot of commercial real estate folks, and that's actually something that they do now, because what they find is that is a huge lure, and it just gives the, uh, the businesses that they're working with so, much, so many more capabilities. So it's been interesting to see how that's <laughs> changed just over the last 10 years. Even with Columbus One, which used to be Columbus 2020, you know, we work with them, as I'm sure you do as well, John, you know, when they're bringing customers to, you know, Ohio and into th this area, one of the key selling points is that they can say, you know, there's a lot of fiber in the area, there's data centers in the area, there's all these things so that whatever that business needs to communicate, it's now really a selling point to bring people into the area. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a it's kind of a check the box thing too with uh, you know with uh, site survey people or uh, site selection people rather. And I we did a fiber project for a municipality. You know, it's a suburb outer suburb. And he said the mayor was pretty colorful. He goes, you know, if you look at Columbus, there's a there's a donut and there's a hole in the middle and there's you know space outside of it. And he goes, we've been outside that donut too long. And his point was is that you know the infrastructure things that they didn't participate in that other progressive communities did you know, it, it set them back in ways. And so they wanted to make that investment because it, it at least gets them on the map and now they're in the consideration. So the more at bats you get, the better that is for your, your community and your residents. Mm -hmm. You know, that's interesting. Um, you know, I, th I think it might've been you, Nancy, we were talking before in, in uh, you know, relative to what you're seeing on, on people evaluating, uh, you know, the whole where you live thing. And, and I think there's been instances that you mentioned where we're seeing folks kind of vacate the, the, um, the home base data center in pushing it out to the cloud, looking at more of an OPEX versus a, a CAPEX kind of scenario. And, you know, again, if, if folks aren't in the building that you've got the data center in, it's kind of hard to justify that. So maybe talk a little bit about, 
you know, you're so, so it's, you know, as long as you've got broadband capabilities, you can kind of work from there. But what about the data center? You know, how, how, how are you seeing that impacting, um, you know, what folks are doing in the data center, data center space and, you know, going kind of, you know, virtual or, or cloud versus, you know, a, um, you know, an on-site data center. Right, exactly. I mean, we're seeing a lot of companies that, you know, one, they're realizing that what they do um, is, is where they need to spend their time and that the data center piece is not their core business. To put a nice data center together for a company will cost millions of dollars. And so, and that doesn't include what they have to do then to keep it up, right? You have to generators and UPS and power and all those things. So we've seen a huge flux of the enterprise basically giving up those data centers or consolidating those data centers and coming into facilities like ours. And so we become their data center. And what's great is they can design it the way they want. They have the security the way they want, you know, the connectivity. We have several customers that come in, as I mentioned before, that put their network core here because they can connect to all the different carriers. It's a savings for them. And it's also, um, you know, an ease of doing business and it does become an operating expense instead of a capital expense. Another advantage to it is on, when you kind of look for the security piece, I had a customer who had their own on-prem data center and everybody had access. So they had hundreds of IT people that would come in. Everybody thought it was cool to go into the data center. And this was a great opportunity that they now have five people that can come and go. And so really use that to, again, you know, make an operating cost, not have to deal with that. And now they can control who goes in and out. Because as we know, people are do more harm than anybody with circuits and power and you know equipment. So, so yes, we've seen a lot of that from our customers coming from all over the country, um, from the cloud, yep. doing more and more um, because of the work from home or the applications. Obviously, speed to um, turn things up is important to be competitive. You have to turn up applications very quickly, which is where the cloud helps with that. And because we have AWS you know, physically in our facility, we have customers from all over the country coming here so that they have low latency and it's more secure and they can get right on and be able to design the applications that they want. Well, we see that too, because, you know, I hate to use a term that we may not, everybody not, may not know, but the dot-com boom, um, you know, when, when all these organizations started growing out their IT and, and when that became actually ways that people ran their businesses and you had physical servers, I mean, people were filling data closets like crazy. So, you know, look at the number of data centers that were built from 2000 to 2013 or so. It's crazy. But, you know, a couple of big things have happened since that, and that is virtualization and cloud. So we find a lot of these large organizations and, and small ones too, but you know they've a lot of times they've built these wonderful facilities that are you know highly redundant, highly secure, but they've only used 25, 35 percent of the power that's available. You know they may be only using 50 percent of the footprint floor space because they just they can sprawl. They don't need it all. Uh, and now it's coming back to you know they they first of all it was a big ask to get the money up front to build these, but people knew it needed to be done. But now it's coming back where those are aging facilities and people need to reinvest the capital to keep them up. Air handlers, generators, UPS, you, you name it. And so companies are like, wait a minute, why are we managing this asset? And, and it, it's, it's depreciating and we're putting cash into it and we're not fully utilizing it. So, you know, I think that's a big driver too, where people are saying, let's get our stuff into a, a Cologics for Colo or, you know, into Expedient for, co uh, for cloud and co-location. And then obviously the hyperscalers. So, you know, we're seeing a, a big push from that perspective as well. Yeah, and that's probably worth 50% of our growth is coming from that market. They want to be where the connectivity is so that they can reach everybody that needs to get to them. And so they're coming to facilities yeah. like ours and John's to, to be able to do that because they can't do that in their data center. They need that connect point. Mm -hmm. That's what we can provide. Well, the other exciting sure. thing is, you know, we've got hyperscalers and softwares and service companies that are clients of ours and, and, and Nancy as well, where, you know, they aren't building data centers in every city. And, you know, Microsoft does not need a data center in every facility, but guess where people play Xbox? Everywhere, right? So, so Microsoft and AWS and, and Google and others are taking down space in our facilities because they need to be close to the consumer that's that's utilizing their service, whether that's a, a business or even from a, a quantity perspective, more more residential uh, consumers. Absolutely. Yeah, and we all know that if, 
if you don't have a great connection at the home and your and your uh, child cannot get the connectivity that he needs to play his, uh, you know, the the Call of Duty or whatever, that you know, they start screaming. That's for sure. Um, well, you know, so so that's an interesting point. So let me ask this. So we've talked a lot about, you know, what, what I would call A and Z, right? So so uh, the last mile, as Dave mentioned, and then and then the data center. Uh, in, in talking about the hyperscalers and kind of moving out uh, instead of having, you know, fewer big data centers kind of moving out and getting maybe closer to uh, the endpoints, what role do you see, you know, the, the middle mile playing? I mean, how important is it to have middle mile providers? You know, again, we, we hear a lot about the, the last mile. You hear a lot about the cloud or, or the data center, but, you know, What's the importance of importance of that that middle mile in the overall long haul that works, et cetera? So I'll I'll take that one right away. W without the middle mile, there would be no last mile. Uh, it is incredibly incredibly important to have that that backbone, you know, the, to to backhaul the data from the last mile, you know, wherever we can collect it and get it to you know, the internet and, you know, the internet is an antiquated term now because now it's the cloud, but that's really what it is, is how do we, how do we get from the house to the world? And without a robust middle mile, that just would not happen. The nice mm -hmm. thing, there's a lot of fiber out there. So a lot of people can work together. One of the nice things with the IX is that there's a lot of carriers that combine you know, for example, like with Horizon, you have your area where you're really strong, and then you may use another carrier to help for that piece. You know, because there's so much fiber, we don't need to spend the money to continually build new networks. So it's important that all of those providers work together so that we can, especially for the rural areas, because a lot of the regionals, they have a piece out there, but they need to be able to complete the network. So that middle mile and being able to work together and share your networks and and play off each other makes, you know, is really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much, how much consideration is there when, when, you know, folks are making some of these decisions to move to the cloud, when they make a decision to move to your data center, how much consideration is there, um, you know, being put into that capability, you know, that, that middle mile to get the access, uh, not just connectivity to, to the internet, but, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people moving significant amounts of data. Um, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts on how, you know, I, I think back, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I'll I think uh, John put it best kind of back in the day, you know, I think about um, T1s, DS3s, and then, you know, kind of, you know, right now it's, you know, 10 gig, 100 gig, 800 gig discussions. Um, you know, maybe talk a little bit about maybe, you know, John and Nancy, what you're seeing in that regard and, and how the middle mile is, is playing a part in, uh, you know, capabilities for, you know, large hyperscalers uh, or of the like to, to expand and do what they need to do. Yeah, I, I can start. I mean, that's got, that's got layers to it. Um, you know, the, the access, it, it's a combination of bandwidth and latency. And so that's one of the things that we do with our clients is you know, we'll assess what their interdependencies are between application groups and workloads. Because when they start thinking about moving them to you know, a data center or a cloud, they need to know what's gonna talk back and forth. And some of the cloud providers, you know, the hyperscalers will charge data transfer. So you have to figure out what your ingress egress is on what's talking to each other. So I, th there's all this complexity around it. Uh, so it, it kind of depends. But, you know, the, the municipality I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, they weren't getting any at bats with the with the large data centers were built in central Ohio because they didn't have what they needed. You know, and, and I'm not saying that a, a site selector um, didn't do their job. But, you know, if you land a business someplace and, and all of a sudden you're 10 times your budget for what you need and uh, bandwidth, that's a problem. Um, so we, we see that all the time. And, you know, and like you especially look at like some of the manufacturing uh, companies we work with and even agriculture. Um, you know, cloud for them is tough because they just can't get to where they need to be. Uh, so, you know, they're hamstrung with, with trying to do the things that people are doing in the fields or uh, in their manufacturing facilities that they may not be able to do without continuing to invest heavy capital 
and having to have a lot, loads of teams that support that, which you know supports the business, but it isn't the business. So the the access to that is is just becoming, uh, or the importance uh, and the the dependency of that's becoming greater and greater. Exactly. I mean, and speaking about the manufacturing and the farming and, and all of that, you know, now you have IoT um, coming into play. So now all of their devices are running on data. So that's bandwidth or, and, you know, need to be secure and some work with the cloud to do that. So everything they do now um, affects bandwidth. You used to think it was just, you know, storage or data or, you know, um, talking to one another. And now pretty much every aspect of what everyone does needs some kind of data, needs some kind of network. So you've really seen that convergence where you don't have just a network team anymore. Now they're, um, you know, your IT and your telecom and everybody are combined together trying to make that happen. And, you know, we see a lot of customers that come to us because of that connectivity. So they can't get multiple carriers. Um, as Dave said, you know, on the residential side, on the commercial side as well, there's several that can't get you know, the bandwidth or the carriers that they need. And if they could, it would be so expensive, right? Because for them to build in. So that's why a lot of them do come and put their network there because then they have access to all those carriers and then they can do what they need to do in an affordable way and they know it's in a secure way. And mm -hmm. from the end user perspective, access to the internet is no longer just being able to check your email or being able to surf the web. Uh, you know, you mentioned you know, agriculture. There are tractors that are Wi-Fi equipped that, you know, report their maintenance status, that connect with the manufacturer for software updates on agricultural equipment. You know, when small manufacturers are trying to expand, they've got IoT to deal with and they have to have the connectivity to be able to do that expansion. And then one of the one of the biggest, uh, of course, concerns in Southeast Ohio is oil and gas. That's a major industry for us. And a lot of that is being automated. And that automation, anything from, you know, controls to measurements, all of that also requires connectivity. So it's extremely important that we be able to haul that back to those data centers and back to the central points where that data needs to go. And all of the, mm -hmm. a lot of your um, areas as well. So I know, I'm sure like Dan where, or Dave, where you're at, you know, in Columbus, you've got each suburb. So you've got, as John mentioned, New Albany and Dublin and all these different areas are really working to get that fiber into their um, into their areas and into the homes of the residents and to the businesses. Because again, they know it's very yep. important. One, the work from home so that people do want to build, do want to buy there and do want to stay there and for the businesses so they'll come there. So they are investing huge amounts of dollars to put their own fiber networks in to then again, connect with that middle um, connection to get out so that, you know, that people want to come there. And that's becoming a huge economic development piece. For almost every suburb. Sure, and I think I think it gets you know those are all you know such valid areas, and you know, I think when you look at public safety and education, um, you know just just the access to the data and the services in your home. I mean, I remember just with the pandemic, you know, you had you know families in disadvantaged uh, areas where you know they're going to a McDonald's to get Wi-Fi so that their kids can do their schoolwork. I mean, how how you know difficult is that? You know, and I mentioned, you know, we did a project up in Columbiana County and, you know, driving up to Canton and then you head east and, you know, Columbiana County is on the river on the very eastern part of Ohio. And you just reach a spot where there's absolutely no cell coverage. And it's, you know, probably a 10 mile stretch. And if you look at the buildings along the road, it's, it's bleak. You know, there's just, there's nothing, you know, vibrancy happening there. And I, I just think about how my kids learn and how much they're on their phones. And we can all laugh and joke about how bad social media might be. But the amount of information they have access to, and not to mention the fact that their schools all use Google Docs or you know whatever, if you're talking about raising a family in a home that doesn't have it or in a region that doesn't have it, your your life experiences and your your access to information, your quality of life are significantly impacted. And, and the same thing goes for public safety. You know, we worked with the first net project in the state, and you know we we would work with all the municipalities and the county and the first responders. 
And, you know, it was amazing to see what the areas that had the capacity from a wireless perspective could do for public safety, whether it was, you know, locating firefighters in situations or, or you know, uh, uh, police officers having access to information quickly and being able to show back what they were, the situation they're in. And then you talk to these rural places like, we can't do that. If we if that's our primary medic, uh, means of communication with a first responder, that person's going to be out of luck and disconnected. So, you know, that's mm -hmm. just another uh, layer of this that's, I think, you know, oftentimes overlooked. And the security, Absolutely. right? Cameras with police. I mean, being able to go back and see what happened or to be able to track something down. I mean, all of that is, you have to have connectivity. Sure. So, so kind of taking that to the next level, right? There's uh, um, significant efforts uh, by by all fronts, from a federal perspective, from a state perspective, grant dollars, you know, significant push to get broadband out into the rural uh, footprint. You know, right now there's both private and public um, push to 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 build fiber to the home to get wireless service providers to extend out. So, so my next question is, how, how does 5G play into it all? You know, I mean, there's, I, I can tell you, you know, I, I'm, I'm certain everybody on, on, the, uh, on the webinar has seen ads on 5G and it's deploying throughout the U.S. at, at, a, at very rapid pace. I can tell you we're fortunate enough to be helping to build out um, a lot of the, the, the fiber to the small cell. But, you know, from your perspective, you know, how, how will 5G play into that and, and how will having millions of access points um, you know, out there, you know, drive and, and change the landscape in that regard. So from our perspective, you know, 5G, it's, it's another piece to the puzzle. You know, getting rural broadband access is a, it's a, it's a multifaceted problem. So there's not going to be a single solution. There's no silver, silver bullet. You know, there's no one thing that's going to fix it for everybody. There are areas mm -hmm. where 5G is going to be great. It's going to work wonderfully if you're within a certain distance of a tower and provided that tower is not overly saturated and that that middle mile has the capacity to carry it. Uh, you know, there are, there are other solutions that are out there, including, you know, low earth orbit satellites and, uh, you know, everyone would like the same thing. We would love to have fiber to every home, but, and, and eventually we're going to get there. You know, just like we did finally get electricity to all rural homes, you know, which is which is kind of the model that our cooperative is based on is the same same model that they used for electric cooperatives back in the 30s. But there's there's got to be a lot of the different aspects that are that are put into place. 5G is part of it. You know, satellites may work for some, but not for others. Uh, you know, we're using a combination of fixed wireless and and uh, where we can fiber to, to get that access. So it's gonna take a lot of different solutions and 5G is just another piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. I think Dave brings up a lot of good points because it's, you know, the, there's this panacea around 5G and all things it enables and it does, but where is it available? And then what does it, what is it be able to penetrate and reach? Because uh, I know there's, you know, issues right now where, you know, it may be hanging on a pole, you know, outside your office building, but it may not be getting inside the office. So, you know, it, the, the reality is, is that the capacity and the throughput and all that goodness is is real. And I think it's got a lot of great applications right now, uh, especially things that are outdoor. I mean, I know we've got our smart city uh, grants, which are relying on a lot of that stuff heavily. And, you know, this is where edge computing, getting actually to the cell towers uh, is big. But I think the the impact it's going to have is, is going to be directly correlated to uh, how accessible it is. I, I was super excited to get on my phone and I realized I had to buy a new phone, which wasn't a big deal because I needed an upgrade, but paying an extra $10 a month to not be able to use it very many places, I was like, I'll, I'll hold off for right now. Yeah, I think people yep. need to realize, you know, as you said, Glenn, I mean, advertising, people would think that it's available now. And, you know, as soon as they buy that phone, they're good to go. And it's really such a small percentage that have true 5G, um, that have the yep. true speed and the software. There's so many things behind it. You know, the towers, there's a lot of software that has to be developed. There's so much technology sure. that has to be rolled out for, free, you know, for true 5G. So five, 10 Absolutely. years from now, you know, we're probably going to have a different conversation and it'll probably be, you know, a huge impact. Um, today, you know, everybody's 
preparing for it, you know, so we're working with them in the preparation. But as far as really yeah. seeing what it's going to do, I don't, I, you know, I think we're a ways off. Sure. Yeah, you know, and, you know, as, as Dave mentioned, uh, you know, everything has limitations, obviously, you know, in building, um, you know, signals and, and that kind of thing. So uh, interesting question from the group here, um, you know, and so I'll, I'll, I'll pose it, but I'll also provide a little bit of um, feedback from my perspective as well. The, the question is related to um, how we're seeing telemedicine drive you know, additional bandwidth needs as well. And, and I think it, it also goes kind of to, to John's point earlier where, you know, I think, um, you know, having these type of capabilities, I mean, it goes beyond educational uh, impact in, in areas that don't have broadband, but also from a healthcare perspective as well. You know, we're fortunate enough to deal with a lot of, um, you know, actually most of the, the major healthcare providers in the area. And I think What's interesting is, is, is we kind of worked with a lot of them through the pandemic. Um, I think a lot of the telemedicine was available before, uh, not necessarily a new technology, uh, but I think that, you know, it was interesting to see how doctors were really forced um, to, to adapt and, and adopt that, that technology. And, um, you know, I, I think absolutely the, you know, I don't know that it's driving incremental connectivity needs from a residential perspective, but I can certainly tell you that from um, the healthcare perspective, making sure that, you know, doctors that are, you know, reading x-rays or doctors that are getting, um, you know, complex files that, that they're, you know, maybe even doing that from home or from, you know, different locations, uh, the connectivity needs to be there to push those massive files. So I, you know, I, I do believe that it's, uh, of, that it, that connectivity does play a part in that, um, you know, maybe not so much as, as some of the other applications from a residential perspective, but I do believe that, you know, from probably a data center perspective and from a, um, you, you know, an end user perspective uh, for an actual uh, healthcare institution, you know, it's definitely having uh, an impact when you're driving. I, I don't remember, I, I wish I remembered the, the actual statistics um, but we did one of our webinars was related to healthcare, and um, I think it was actually Memorial Health System down in Marietta uh, had the statistics of the amount of telemedicine um, appointments they were doing uh, per day, per week, per month. They were mind blowing. I was I was very surprised with the amount of output and productivity. Uh, so so there again, I think. You know, just like anything else, well, if we can do this remotely, you know, why don't we do that remotely? So, uh, but, I'll, but, I'll, but I'll pose the question to the group, you know, thoughts on how telemedicine is, is potentially changing connectivity needs, um, you know, in the marketplace. Yeah. So obviously, the, the, the more connectivity we can get, the more people can take advantage of telehealth and telemedicine. And, and by the way, this includes uh, some initiatives that our local veterans administrations are working on, too, to... Uh, to be able to reach out to vets so that they can get those services without without having to drive hours and hours. Um, you know, the, during the pandemic, obviously, people were a little leery of going to a hospital because that's where all the sick people are. So if you could take care of a routine appointment or, you know, something as, as um uh common as a counseling session or to review prescriptions. You know, those things can be done remotely. It saves people a trip to the hospital. It really does. And that's why the, the statistics from Memorial are so important. It does drive the need even further and makes us push even harder to get it done. Yeah, and I think that's one of those things that comes back to, you know, healthcare organizations have seen the boon of that because doctors can now see way more people. You know, there's all kinds of elective uh, things that can be done more quickly uh, and less expensive. And you look at just central Ohio, like a company like Language Access Network, you know, CloudBreak, you know, they were getting utilized and were doing very well. But when their services became needed because people realized we could shift this from everybody coming in to everybody, us reaching out, they blew up. UpDocs is another great example where, you know, their growth was meteor, meteoric because the, the light switch hit for the healthcare systems. I think the other side of this is, is that if you don't have access to in-home tele, telemedicine, you know, again, what, what, how does that impact your, your quality of life? You know, and I, you know, looking back at COVID, I, I actually got that back in July. And thank God I didn't have to leave a house to go see the doctor. 
but you know, you talk about critical care for people. And again, I think this is another thing. If people have access in their homes, they can take advantage of it. If they don't, you know, that's another thing that they're missing out on that uh, folks that have availability uh, do enjoy. Yeah, I worked with a hospital at one time. And one of the things that they did is, is really try to understand too, once they released a patient, you know, what that care is to keep them from going back. And a huge part of that was telehealth. Or they found that there were some people that would just, you know, would come to the health, but they wouldn't go to the doctor. Um, for some reason, they were embarrassed about something. But once they could get somebody and they didn't want somebody to come into their home, they didn't want them to see how they lived or where they did. But once they could use a phone and call in, then they were willing to do that. And then their health care improved because now they could see a doctor, they could be monitored, they could take care of those things. They were all in areas that were 30 to 40 minutes from a hospital or to, you know, to the larger healthcare. So it really allows you to extend who you serve and how you serve them. And as John said, I mean, the huge increase of all the peripherals, right? All those companies that are working with the prescriptions and, you know, the companies that are setting up telemedicine, especially for the smaller doctors, right? So the large hospitals had systems, they may not be using them that much, but the others needed to do it and need to do it quickly. And historically, your small office, medical offices, they don't have an IT staff, right? So they don't know and they can't set these things up quickly. So you have all of these companies that have, like Updocs is a, is a key example of that. Now all those smaller medical offices can offer this service so that all the patients and whoever you serve take, care, take advantage. Yep, absolutely. Well, and I would say even um, embarrassingly, I think from a convenience perspective, I'm one of those guys that just doesn't have time to go to the doctor, right? So if I can, you know, jump on a call and, and, uh, and, and hey, doc, check this out. Certainly, uh, again, I think overall um, quality of life, because you're, you're, you're probably utilizing that type of a service more than, you know, going waiting in a, in a, in a lobby for 20 minutes and then waiting in a waiting room for 20 minutes. And so, um, you know, great question. Thanks for sending that through. Um, so let me ask this, you know, as, as, you know, maybe more for, uh, for, for Nancy and, and John relative to, you know, data centers as, as more applications move to the cloud, uh, you know, I think a lot of folks might say, well, gosh, you know, that must be hurting the data centers. Um, you know, talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the growth uh, you know, I think I think the the explosion in the cloud actually benefits a lot of what you do. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about you know what what that impact looks like, how you're being impacted by the growth of the cloud, and then maybe you know maybe some emerging markets that that you see kind of filling some of that demand. You know, where are you seeing the the most growth in that regard? I know for us it's been huge. Um, you know, a lot of customers go to the cloud. But to do 100% cloud is very expensive. So a lot has gone to a hybrid model where you still need some of your gear, um, but you also want to connect to the cloud. So that's one aspect where we've had a lot of growth. They want to be in facilities like ours because they can have a low latency access to the cloud or to the carriers, but yet they also have their equipment so they can do that hybrid situation. Um, also the hyperscalers and the cloud providers themselves, they need to have need to be where there's low latency, they need to be where there's large, um, a lot of amount of carriers so that people can get to them. So for us, we have grown in the last three years, we've tripled our growth. And a lot of that is because of customers, one, the hyperscale wanting to be in facilities like us and companies wanting to be close to that edge as well. So combined with what we talked about before, you know, not wanting to have your own brick and mortar data center and now having that connectivity piece being so important, it's really created a huge demand for us and which is why we're building now a fourth data center in Columbus and looking for land for another one after that. So and that's really, we've seen that across the board in all of our markets. Yeah, I, I agree with what Nancy is saying. You know, I mentioned earlier, some of the things that, you know, like desktop as a service, you know, all of these things that, you know, people have looked at like, well, I have pride of ownership. Like I have, control. These are all the things that are important to me. And then when you realize that you're in a crisis and what's important is serving the business and you don't have time or you're splitting your time between having to do that communication and that understanding of how it's impacting to determine what needs to be fixed, it's not a fun position to be in. 
So, you know, that's just, that's just it. You know, the people who've lived through some type of a disaster recovery event that's meaningful, you know, change their behavior oftentimes and, and also get budget for it. You know, we have a big utility here that, you know, was trying to get a secondary data center for years and years and years. And until their main fiber uh, got melted that took them offline, the board wouldn't give them money for it. So, you know, I think those are all the things where we're getting real awareness and people are starting to look at what they have to do. And, and cloud's interesting too. And, and we've seen the growth. I mean, we're, our cloud business is growing over 30% year over year. We think we're scratching the surfaces. People adopt more and more types of clouds and have to manage all that. Uh, and that's where we fit in. Uh, but, you know, if you, if you look at it from the, the perspective of I've, I've outsourced this responsibility. Now, now what do I focus on? And again, that gets more into a, a business outcome, but we're seeing a, a huge drive for this stuff. And you know, one of the things we had Dave Lith to come speak to our group. Uh, he's a cloud uh, uh, spectator expert. And he, he did a study and it looked at what were people doing in the cloud before the pandemic and what have they been doing since? And if you look at what was happening before, it was a lot of sexy stuff. You know, it was like serverless, you know, containers, you know, uh, cloud native, which are all important parts and benefits you extract from the cloud. But when they actually had to start utilizing cloud during the pandemic, what we've seen is a switch to things like, well, I actually have to migrate this. Stuff. Like I have to migrate workloads. It just can't all be net new. How do I get what I need over there? And now it's, I've got stuff in the cloud, security operations you know, development operations, management, you know, all of these things need to be done because you have to be able to control that and keep your data secure as well as functional. And so we've seen a shift in, in those, you know, those sexy things have kind of backed down a little bit and significantly in some areas, but these other things have creeped up as people realize if my stuff's out there, we have to figure out how we manage it just like what we do in our inside our own data centers. You know, and a lot of people have had to shift as well um, how they do business, right? So you think of all these retail, everything was coming into the store. Now everything has switched to online and to mobile apps for so many different things. And so application and development of that is so much quicker in the cloud. And so that's another reason that the cloud has just increased um, more and more. And so, yes, they're using that, but they also have to be able to have the systems to maintain it and to, to do both. So we're seeing a lot of companies that have done that shift and the cloud and the data and all of that has been a huge component of that. Well, that's a great point. Right. I mean, you know, Ecologix and Expedia have both seen the benefit of those retail shifts where, yeah. you know, one of the largest uh, uh, cloud providers in our space is a retailer that the retailers stay away from. And so that, that's driven a lot of business our way too, because it's been explosive in growth for the retailers just as, as it has been for Amazon and some of those other online giants. Absolutely. Well, we're, we're running out of time a little bit here. So, so two quick items. Um, if, if there are any questions, you know, certainly put them into the question box. We'll try to get to some of those. Uh, and, and like I said, if there's some questions after the fact, um, I'll do my best to get them to the appropriate folks and, and, and respond to those. I'll ask one more quick question to Dave, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap up and, uh, and bump around the horn with some closing statements. But, you know, as I'm thinking about, about, some of the things that that uh, John and Nancy were talking about, Dave, in, in being your, you know, you've got background in cybersecurity. Um, you know, what, what are you seeing in, in that regard? So I've got to imagine there's, you know, heightened uh, attention from from that perspective as you push things to the cloud, you know, as, as you're, you know, lighting networks and you're doing, you know, what you do, you know, what, what's the impact, you know, relative to paying attention to cybersecurity and attacks and, and keeping the network clean as people move to the cloud? Well, the, 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 the mantra there for cybersecurity is there really is no cloud. It's just somebody else's data center, but it's still a data center. And uh, uh, just a real quick story. I have a friend who teaches at one of the local colleges and he was, uh, he was doing a session on hard drives, on physical hard disks. And one of the students says, well, why are we studying this? We don't need that anymore. And he looked a little perplexed and said, well, what do you mean? We don't need it anymore. Well, we don't need hard drives anymore because everything goes in the cloud. So there's this concept that the cloud is this big nebulous thing and everything goes in there and nobody really knows what happens afterwards. But it truly right. is between the data center providers and the cloud providers, the fundamentals of security are still there and they still need to be applied. 
and you know privacy and identification of data, protection of data, all that still goes into play, even though it's in quote unquote the cloud. It's even yeah. more important, actually. I mean, any cloud that you go to now, I mean, the security has to be such a huge component of how you're managing that data. So it's bigger than ever. Well, and, and Absolutely. It's like this has been the, the age old, you know, uh, reality in IT is that even though we've had all of these things that have, you know, used to be done by people that have gotten extracted into a software layer at some level, uh, the IT jobs are growing. You know, the amount of data centers being built is growing. And, you know, enterprises may be consolidating their own and, you know, selling off uh, assets that they don't use anymore. But that's all going someplace because, you know, the, the amount of space and what cloud is doing and the number of jobs still in IT, it's not eroding it. And, you know, we, we talk about focus on your business, not on your infrastructure. You know, if you look at how much more time people have when they take, when they get those non- uh, strategic, those those tactical things off their plate, they aren't getting to everything they need to from a security perspective right now. You know, they aren't doing everything they can to make the most use of their data that they're collecting right now. You know, they're not serving the business as well as they could. So even though they're moving that stuff outside of their walls potentially or into somebody else's, there's <laughs> still a rapid growth and need for IT uh, professionals and data center space and cloud services. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you continue to roll with that, John. Any any closing any closing thoughts? You know, you're on a roll there. Any closing thoughts you'd like to, to add to that for the group? Oh, man. I, yeah, I concluded my thoughts. So I think I'm done for 10 minutes or so. That's all I got. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's just, I think that's just the maturation. You know, this was the one of the reasons why I got into cloud computing to begin with. And you know, I've been doing it for 12 or 13 years. You know, AWS EC2 came out 15 years ago. And what was really in interesting to me was that it was the first time, and I've been in technology my whole career, that I started dealing on a regular basis with the business ownership and leadership. So a lot of times I wouldn't even work within the IT organization until one or two meetings. And, you know, you really learn what the what's important to the business. And, you know, we've got an IT leaders group here that's run in central Ohio. And that's a big part of what they're trying to do is like, Anybody in tech knows the tech, you know, that that's a given. How does the business look at it? And what does the business want to invest in? You know, they're willing to invest in technology. It just needs to be articulated a way that the business can understand it. And it has to be delivered in a way that serves the business. So, you know, I just think it's real interesting. I think that's one of the biggest benefits of, of cloud uh, and co-location is it just, you know, we have a slick on, uh, we, we're buying data centers right now and we're buying it from enterprises. It's like, you're not in the data center business. Why are you running a data center? You know, focus on your mm -hmm. business and, you know, leave that stuff that's more tactical and, and heavy lift without the uh, strategic upside to other people that can do that and do that every day. Yep, absolutely. That's great. Thanks for that. Thanks for that feedback, John. Nancy, how about, how about you? Any closing thoughts for the group? Yeah, I just think, you know, the times, I mean, it's exciting now, just all the things that can be done quickly. You know, you look at artificial intelligence and, virtual reality and all these things as far as education and how we develop things and how we do our jobs. You know, all the jobs are gonna be so different 10 years from now and how we develop and how we decide that, you know, are using these technologies, using the cloud, using, you know, the data centers to protect that and connectivity. You know, we see the connectivity as one of the key things for everyone, whether it be to the cloud, whether it be to carriers, whether it be to just other companies, as John said, SaaS providers, storage providers, everyone is to be able to quickly communicate. We don't, everything we wanna do, we wanna do it now. So the ability to go in and add a cloud provider now, add to a carrier now, that's kind of where we're going and where we see the connectivity and where our customers are really, really excited. And I, I think that's just gonna explode in the next you know, four or five years and further. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, Nancy. Dave, you wanna take us home? I will, and I wanna end this on a positive note because we've talked about a lot about the need and why we have to have it and the lack of access. But what I wanna to, to kind of end with is we are making a difference. We are connecting people that have never been connected before. We've been able to put internet into homes that, that haven't had access before now. 
And, you know, that with the, the, the partners that we have, and, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and put a thank you into Horizon because you guys have been great. Without that, this wouldn't be happening. And we are making a difference. And, you know, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that we are pressing forward. And would also like to invite anyone from, uh, from the big city, come on down, visit little Marietta once in a while. Uh, before long, we'll have free Wi-Fi downtown and you'll be able to connect when you come down for the Sternwheel Festival. Well, that's an interesting point too, Dave. I mean, look at how big Marietta was when, you know, rivers were our primary forms of transportation. I mean, that was a commerce hub. You know, and, and you can just follow this from, from trails to streams, to canals, to railroad, to highways. You know, what we see is the cities that are the most vibrant are connected to that. And, you know, if you look at what Ohio has done from an investment in infrastructure around fiber and what communities have done, you can see the most vibrant communities have an abundance of that. And there's, there's no reason that we can't have that across more of the state than we do right now. And, and I think you can see that direct correlation between what that does to your community from an economic perspective, from a public safety perspective, and from a quality of life uh, education perspective. 100%. I agree. Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're in a fortunate situation um, in that, you know, we, we get to see the full scope of, of everything we've described. You know, we, we are able to provide connectivity to the data centers. We provide connectivity to the towers, to the small cell, um, you know, for the WISP. Uh, as well as you know, residential and and um, and enterprise services, and it's it's really you know a, a fun, exciting um, place to be because you know you you see the impact that it has overall. You know, like you said, John, and um, you know, seeing some of the communities that are taking it very seriously and they're fighting for their uh, for their community to 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 build it out and make sure that they're not left behind. Because as you mentioned, you know, some of these areas that that are you know, have got more blight than we'd like to see. I mean, you know, they're, they're behind and they're going to be left behind if they don't continue to, to focus on giving their community. I mean, I think for me, the, the, the takeaway from the conversation today, which was great, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, Nancy, John and, and Dave contributing, it, you know, it's, it's connectivity matters, speed matters and community matters. Uh, you know, I, it, it's great to have, you know, the, the, the four of us on, on the phone, you know, all, all local and, and can really kind of speak to, you know, the impact that what all of our organizations are doing to the region and, and taking an effort and, uh, you know, driver's seat to, to ensure that we continue to put our region uh, at the forefront. So I, I really appreciate, um, you know, Nancy, Dave and John, you, you joining today and providing the, um, you know, some great dialogue and hopefully, uh, you know, everyone that was able to join us today enjoyed the conversation. Uh, again, if we weren't able to get to your questions, uh, I, I want to stay um, true to the time limit, which we're running up on here now. Uh, so I, I, uh, I thank everybody for joining. I want to thank again, Nancy, John, and Dave for, uh, for joining today. And um, again, hope to talk to everybody soon. Have a great rest of the week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.